Hi, welcome to Eyes on Southeast Asia, the premier podcast on foreign policy, security, and economic issues on Southeast Asia, brought to you by Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Today, we're going to have a great discussion on the state of terrorism in Southeast Asia, and we have uh, a world-renowned expert uh, on that subject, which is uh, Miss Sydney Jones. Uh, she is a longtime friend of mine. I've known her for probably 20 to 25 years. And uh, we are very delighted uh, to have her come here. And we're going to talk about uh, the, the challenges emanating from uh, ISIS, uh, returning ISIS uh, fighters to uh, Southeast Asia, what happens to Al-Qaeda, what happens to Jamaa Islamiyah, where are the greatest source of threats in Southeast Asia, uh, and so on. So welcome, Sydney. Thank you very much. Show. Very happy to be here. Uh, before we begin, uh, uh, let me ask you about uh, your, yourself. Uh, uh, how long have you been to Indonesia? What got you here? And I understand you're from New York. Right? Yes. So what brought you to Indonesia and how long? I had actually been in Middle Eastern studies at university, and I applied for a job working on the Middle East and came in second, so they sent me to Jakarta. Uh, so I had no background on Indonesia at all. They sent me to language training for three months before I came, and I never looked back, and I'm so glad I didn't go to the Middle East. Ah, okay. You feel Indonesian because I know you speak Indonesian, you eat Indonesian food every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes I feel more Indonesian than American, but I was, uh, I'm was i a New Yorker born and bred. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Sydney, uh, take us to uh, the landscape of uh, terrorism in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, give us an overview of, of uh, do we see uh, a growing threat or, or, or less threat and who... Are they coming from in terms of terrorism? Okay, I think one way to start is to refer to something called the Global Index on Terrorism, which is a database that's produced by the University of Maryland. And if you look at the Southeast Asian countries in that database, the only Southeast Asian country in the top 10 is the Philippines. So number one is Afghanistan, Number two, I think, is Iraq, and the other obvious, Syria, Nigeria, and so on. But Philippines is way up there. And I think that it's important to recognize that however big the problems are in Indonesia, they're much worse in terms of the number of people killed in terrorist incidents in the Philippines. But I think it's also important to remember that one of the characteristics of the Philippines is that there are so many insurgencies going on simultaneously. So you have the New People's Army, the communist insurgency, you have the Abu Sayyaf group, you have various splinters of some of the other groups like the MILF or the MNLF, even though those two big organizations are certainly not terrorist organizations. And then you have uh, Thailand as being the second country in Southeast Asia, but that's about number 21. Then you have Myanmar. So Thailand is actually more violent than Myanmar, although there are a lot of people worried about the events of this week with the military coup, about whether violence could get much worse. It's unlikely to be terrorist violence, however. It's more likely to be political violence. And then Indonesia is number 37. It's way down on the list. And you think, why is it so low? And you realize that partly because of good law enforcement, partly because of a, a very dispersed terrorist environment, there are actually very few deaths from terrorism, if you think about it, in Indonesia. Uh, and there have been a lot of foiled plots, and it could be much worse than it is, but Indonesia is in a fairly manageable position. I think the terrorist threat in Indonesia is in a way declining from ISIS because, for, well, for a lot of reasons, the loss of territory of ISIS, the enormous number of people arrested by the police and so on. But 
it doesn't mean that terrorism is going away anytime soon. Because if you think about it, many of the people who joined ISIS were people who were already in extremist organizations because they wanted an Islamic state in Indonesia. So if the, their support for ISIS declines, they will likely go back to their original goals. And then we also have an anti-ISIS terrorist organization, and that's Jamaa Islamiyah, which has gotten a lot of attention recently because so many people, including the top leadership, have been arrested, but also because of the discovery that about 60 JI members had been trained in Syria with Al-Qaeda affiliated groups and have come back to Indonesia. Now, the interesting thing is that at least for the moment, they're not interested in violence in Indonesia, but they are interested in being ready to use military force if the political and economic situation should deteriorate to the point where they feel an Islamic state is possible. So I think in the long run, J.I. is the bigger threat than the pro-ISIS groups, which are largely not very well organized, not very well indoctrinated, and not very competent in their terrorism uh, initiatives. But J.I. has a long-term strategy and is therefore, I think, much more dangerous. Uh, tell us why would J.I. members be against uh, ISIS? And secondly, who would be the figurehead of uh, J.I.? In the past, it used to be Abu Bakr Bashir. Uh, who would it be today? Okay, the reason that they are against ISIS is one, because they believed that in the Syria conflict, the real enemy was Bashar al-Assad, and ISIS was more interested in the global jihad than it was in focusing on Bashar al-Assad. Number two, their historical affiliation had been with Al-Qaeda rather than with ISIS, and Al-Qaeda and ISIS were enemies in Syria. But the most important reason was that uh, J.I. actually sent people to ISIS camps in Syria to check out their teachings and decided that they were much too takfiri. That is, they were much too, too fast to brand fellow Muslims as kafir or as infidels or non-believers if they didn't accept ISIS teachings. So it was going too far for Jama'a Islamiyah to see fellow Muslims just indiscriminately declared to be non-Muslims. And so for that reason, ideologically, they were opposed to ISIS. You know, Sydney Abu Bakr Bashir was uh, released uh, res recently after serving, I don't know, 15 years uh, in jail. And so uh, how uh, worried uh, should we be? Uh, is he completely out of the game? Uh, what, what's, what's your assessment on that? I don't think anybody knows what Abu Bakr Bashir thinks because he's lied all his life. He thrives on lies. But I think his influence has dropped very significantly. And I don't think his release will make a major difference. I think it's important to note because many people still associate him with J.I., but in fact, he hasn't been active in J.I. since he was first imprisoned after the Bali bombs. And then he severed all relations with J.I. after 2008, when he founded a new organization called J.A.T., uh, Jamaa Anshara Tawheed. Now, I think he's seen as an elder statesman of the extremist movement in a way. He's seen as someone who all his life has fought for the application of Islamic law. So he's held in great respect, including by some people in the Muslim mainstream, not just uh, terrorists. And there are some people who believe that he may be able to play 
a unifying role among hardliners, conservatives, and people even more extreme in the interest of promoting local regulations that promote Islamic values and Islamic principles. So he's the one person, for example, who could bring maybe some parts of JI together with some pro-ISIS groups in the interests of political advocacy for Sharia regulations. But I don't think you need to worry that he's going to inspire new acts of terrorism. Hmm, okay. L let me bring uh, you back to the Philippines. You mentioned that's the highest threat in, in Southeast Asia. And President Duterte has a strong arm, right? Uh, Iron Man, uh, so to speak. Uh, how effective has that approach been uh, against the terrorist threats in, in the Philippines? And can you also explain... Uh, in terms of the terrorist groups in Southeast Asia, which ones have cross-border activities uh, uh, and, and coordination? Okay, uh, I think that the activities of Duterte have basically promoted the military as the lead agency in fighting terrorism. I think that's also been a priority of the United States, which is also very close to the Philippines on the counterterrorism issue and provides a lot of support to the military, including intelligence support. That means that unlike in Indonesia, where the police are the lead agency and counterterrorism is a question of law enforcement, in the Philippines, it's war. So what we see is the military engaging in major operations in which a lot of people get killed and that use airstrikes, which also hurt civilian areas and cause civilian displacement. So the, there's a lot of resentment in, a, in the Southern Philippines because of military operations in a way that counters whatever positive effect may come from weakening these terrorist groups through such operations. So in the Philippines, the Muslim part of Mindanao has traditionally been the most neglected, the poorest, and the most discriminated against part of the Philippines. It's always at the bottom of the heap. And there's there's a narrative that links that neglect with military brutality and, and problems of the security forces. And that means that no matter how many people are killed in military operations or through airstrikes, there is going to be a new generation arising motivated by vengeance as much as anything else. And that's also true in Poso, by the way, uh, where you have a constant regeneration of people. So in spite of arrests or in spite of security forces actions, you've got to think about where the next generation is coming from. And it's going to be a huge problem for the Philippines. Mm. How, how do you beat that? How do you break that cycle? One of the ways you, you break it is to look at where children of extremists get educated. And one of the things that we're seeing is an increased focus on education for the very young. So kindergartens, preschool groups, the indoctrination starts really young. In Indonesia, it's increasingly Quranic memorization schools. Now, there are a lot of groups that have perfectly legitimate and very good Quranic memorization schools, and that's the key. If there are competing groups run by good organizations that are not indoctrinating their children to see jihad as a major pillar of the faith, that can attract parents to send their children to those schools. So if you have competing schools that are well known as having the latest technology and that can teach your child to memorize the Quran faster than in the extremist schools, you've got something to work with. Mm, okay. Uh, the Jalo uh, bombing, uh, 
I remember uh, before I met with Minister of Defense, I asked you uh, about it, and there were some questions on whether the uh, an Indonesian uh, was involved in that huge uh, Jolo bombing in, in the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, what's the update on that? Yeah. That is such a fascinating case. You were asking about transnational issues. Well, you've got two organizations at least that were involved in the Holo bombings that prove the linkage between Indonesia and the Philippines. So in this case, uh, you had a husband-wife couple, Ruli and Ulfa, who were from Makassar in Indonesia, who had gone to Syria with their, or had gone to Turkey to try and cross over into Syria with their entire family, five children, and they were caught by the Turkish authorities and deported back to Indonesia. One of their children, the eldest boy, got across into Syria. The two eldest girls and then a very young boy and a girl were all uh, sent back with the family to Jakarta. And after just a couple of weeks in a Ministry of Social Affairs shelter, they were allowed to go home. What happens next? Ruli, the husband, decides that he really wants to help out the battle in Marawi in the Philippines, where a, a coalition of pro-ISIS groups had taken control of the city and was fighting the Philippines army. But by the time he got there to uh, the Philippines in around May 2017, uh, later than that, maybe August 2017, it was already impossible to join because there was a siege around the city. So he decided he would join the Abu Sayyaf and he would undertake a jihad action in, cooper in cooperation with the Abu Sayyaf. So then he calls and asks for his family to come over and join him. So who does he call? He calls another group in Indonesia that had pro-ISIS views known as JAD. And there was one man from JAD who was working as an illegal migrant worker on an oil plum, palm plantation in Malaysia. So we already have three countries now, Indonesia, Philippines, and Malaysia. And he asks this migrant worker to help his family get to the Philippines. So the family comes from Makassar to Sabah in, the, in uh, Malaysia, and then they cross over into the Philippines. And a few days after they arrive in January, the husband and the wife, now reunited, become the suicide bombers for the Holo Cathedral, killing about 22 people, I think. But that's not the end of the story because they also brought over their 17-year-old daughter and one of the oil palm workers from Sabah, whom she then married. So at the age of 17, she was married to this migrant worker and really fell in love with him. He joined the Abu Sayyaf as a fighter. She was mostly left on her own, but went to the front a couple of times. He was killed in September, 2020. She was captured by the, Indonesia, by the Philippine army in October, 2020. So a month after her husband was killed, she just gave birth to a baby boy. That means we possibly have a new generation in the works from that particular family. And remember I mentioned that she had a very young sister and brother. The brother is a child soldier with Abu Sayyaf now, thereby creating another link to the Indonesians. The sister is 10 years old and is likely to become a child bride unless somebody finds a way of rescuing her from the Abu Sayyaf. And just on January 6th, 2021, there was a police raid in Makassar and one of the other older sisters in that family who had been sending money to the Philippines to help her sister and her brother-in-law was arrested. 
and her uncle was killed in that raid in January. So in one family, we have two organizations, Abu Sayyaf and JAD. We have about 10 people in the extended family from Indonesia who were uh, fighting or otherwise engaged in the Philippines. And we have Malaysia as the country that never gets any attention because nothing ever happens there. No violence ever happens in Malaysia, but it's always the transit center and it's That's always true. the yeah. financial center. That's true. So yeah. Malaysia is as much involved in terrorism as the other places. There's just no violence there. Yeah, we, we used to complain that, uh, hey, you know, we have all these big terrorists in Indonesia, but it, uh, many of them are coming from Malaysia, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, um, they go Nordin through Malaysia. Azahari, uh, yeah. uh, and so on, yeah. And there's another connection that's quite interesting. It used to be in the Philippines that within the Abu Sayyaf, the pro-ISIS groups were not linked to the pro-kidnapping groups. So Indonesians who were getting kidnapped were not getting kidnapped by pro-ISIS factions. But as the ISIS links have declined and with the drying up of funds from ISIS Central in Syria, the pro-ISIS part of Abu Sayyaf needs money. Where are they gonna get the money from? Ransom money from kidnappings. So, uh, so for the first time in about five years, we're seeing cooperation between the pro-ISIS and the pro-kidnapping factions and Indonesians, unfortunately, are the victims. So there are still, I think, five Indonesians being held hostage in Holo. Uh, Sydney, it's, it's fascinating this uh, story about the connections between uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and, and the Philippines uh, uh, cells. Uh, is, are the counter-terrorists uh, uh, law enforcement people in these countries uh, keeping up. Uh, it seems there seems to be a lot of intelligence that and and coordination and exchange of information that are required to deal with this. Yeah, I think that the cooperation has improved very much over the last two or three years. Uh, but it's interesting when you look at how the cooperation works because it doesn't really work on a multilateral basis. You have to you have to look at it on a bilateral basis. So, for example, between Indonesia and Malaysia, the relationship has always been good on the counterterrorism side. It's handled by the police in both countries. They know each other, they speak the same language, they come from basically the same culture, and they get along very well. So if something happens in Malaysia and an Indonesian gets arrested, somebody picks up the phone, calls his friend, and everything is fine, or her friend, because uh, we now have a really good woman who's head of the counterterrorism police in Malaysia. Uh, but between Malaysia and the Philippines, the relationship isn't good and it's full of mistrust because the Philippines still claims Sabah as being part of the old Sulu Sultanate and is therefore belonging to the Philippines. And that creates an aura of mistrust that really affects counterterrorism cooperation. Between the Philippines and Indonesia, there wasn't that kind of political baggage but the relationship wasn't working all that well. But then partly as a result of Marawi and even more so after the Holo bombings, when it was so clear the Indonesian involvement, that the relationship got much closer and it works much, much better now in terms of information sharing and so on. There's military cooperation as well. So there's patrols in the Sulu Sea that may, serve a useful purpose for protection of shipping, for example, from acts of piracy. It doesn't really work very well as a counterterrorism measure. Um, the Malaysians put a new force together, which is like a counterterrorism coast guard called ESCOM, the Eastern Sabah Security Command. And while there are lots of complaints by 
people who've encountered ESCOM raids, including Indonesian fishermen working out of Sandakan. In fact, they've prevented a lot of Abu Sayyaf attacks in Malaysian waters. So from that perspective, the cooperation is also good. Mm, okay. Uh, actually, a question has to be asked uh, that Indonesians ask a lot. Uh, we touched on this uh, before. The Malaysian terrorists, uh, why is it they're picking targets outside that country? <laughs> uh, what is the ex reasonable explanation for this? Uh, not uh, in Malaysia, but always outside Malaysia. What is, what is uh, the I explanation? I think it goes <laughs> back. There may be several explanations, but I think it may go back to JI days when the Jamaat Islamiyah had their headquarters in Johor, in peninsular Malaysia. And they wanted to keep Malaysia as a nonviolent center for meetings, for financial transfers, for transit from Indonesia through Sabah to the Philippines and so on. So you didn't want to have any big operations in Malaysia that would disrupt Malaysia as a cash cow and Malaysia as a transit center. And also for a long time, anyone from any Muslim country could enter Malaysia without visas. So it was a wonderful place for people from different groups to gather. Um, and for all of those reasons, it was important to the major pro-ISIS groups and lots of other groups not to commit violence in Malaysia. More recently, there were efforts to create groups over Facebook and over social media aimed at violence inside Malaysia, but the special branch caught them before they could do anything. Mm, okay, let's go to Myanmar now. Yeah. Uh, and you know we've had some very unfortunate political events in Myanmar where the, the military junta took over, and you know they've been talking about uh, uh, what they call terrorist groups in the Rakhine state. Uh, what is the state of play uh, with regard to terrorist activities there in in, in Rakhine state? Yeah. I think it's important to understand that that Myanmar is one place where the denial of human rights and the denial of citizenship to the Rohingya in Rakhine state is what created an insurgency there in the first place. So if there had been full citizenship as there was for other ethnic minorities in uh, Myanmar, then we might never have had a militant group emerging. But we did have something called the uh, Arakan uh, Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA, A-R-S-A, also known as Harikat al-Yakin, which was the Arabic term. And this group was not a terrorist group in the sense that they weren't interested in joining the global jihad. All they were interested in was full citizenship for the Rohingya population, but they did use terrorist tactics. So they did behead people, for example, that they saw as informers to the Myanmar military. And they did undertake some acts of terrorism toward other, other groups uh, that they considered living on their territory. But I don't know whether there's any ARSA element left now in Rakhine State after so many members of the population were forced out in uh, October and November to, uh, 2017. And they're all in the camps now in Bangladesh. And ARSA has a very big presence in the camps in Bangladesh. What's concerning now is that there is also a new militant splinter, we think, of ARSA that has identified with ISIS and recently published online a magazine where it declared its support for ISIS. There's, there's a debate back and forth about whether it's genuine or not, but we think it's a tiny fringe of even the militant 
Rohingya population and that it doesn't have widespread support from ARSA. So I'm not sure it's something we really have to worry too much about. But ARSA has now a captive audience in that, those Bangladesh camps where it may well be recruiting young men and women to join forces to go back across the border and create uh, problems. And that's going to continue until they're granted rights. I should also mention one one other uh, aspect of Rakhine State is that there is also something called the Arakan Army, mm -hmm. which is a Buddhist organization, which also believes that the Myanmar Army has not done enough to protect their rights, and they've been increasingly active as well. So it's not just the Muslims. Sydney, let's talk about the returning ISIS fighters. Uh, what is uh, the latest on that in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, how many have returned and how are the laws uh, in different Southeast Asian countries coping uh, with this? Okay, uh, it's a really interesting topic that has also been affected by COVID because there was discussion before COVID about bringing vulnerable nationals home, for example, unaccompanied children under the age of 10. Uh, which some countries had brought back. And there were beginning to be discussions in Indonesia and Malaysian places. And those completely came to an end with COVID. So let's talk about numbers. Uh, no one knows exactly how many Indonesians went to Syria, but roughly we think that if you take the people deported who didn't get into Syria, but only got as far as Turkey, plus the number who did get to Syria, plus the number who got killed, you're a little bit over a thousand total. The number of deportees is about 500 something. And in a way they're more dangerous than the people who actually made it across the border and then came back. Why? Because they didn't have a chance to become disillusioned. They were caught before they could see what it was really like on the ground. And so there have been a number who've been involved in terrorist activities since they returned, of whom Ruli, the Holo bomber, is one of them. Of the people who are currently in Syria and who didn't manage to get out, we think the number is about 600 total. And of that number, there are probably between 300 and 400 in the camps run by the Kurds in northeastern Syria. And many of those people are women and children. Because what was characteristic about ISIS is that it attracted whole families. And there were lots of people who went with very young children. There was even one family from Indonesia that went with a 78-year-old mother of the guy leading the group who was wheelchair bound and they got her in her wheelchair across the border into Syria. Into a war uh, zone too. <laughs> yeah, and she later died of illness uh, of natural causes. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the situation for the Indonesian nationals in those camps is really terrible. And they are subjected to, no matter how good the Kurds tried to manage the camps, and there is access by humanitarian organizations, but they don't have enough people to patrol the camps. And so they're run by pro-ISIS women, basically. And these camps for women and children are places where recruitment and indoctrination is continuing to take place. So unless and until Indonesia can bring back those nationals and figure out how to re-educate them or reintegrate them, we have the real possibility of another generation growing up in those camps. And sooner or later, they are going to be released. Sooner or later, they're going to be able to get out of there. The other thing that's happening, which is equally of concern, is that as Indonesian fighters died in Syria, 
their widows married again, but they married non-Indonesians in many cases. So we have Indonesians married to Senegalese. We have Indonesians married to Chechens. We have Indonesians married to Syrians and you name it. And what does that mean? That means in the future, we could see international collaboration among terrorist organizations based on the marriage links of the Indonesian women. And it means the women are really important and it's really important to try and understand those links and gather data where possible. But uh, I, I think the, the focus now is on what do you do with those people who are stranded in the camps? Are you gonna let them stay there forever? The men are mostly in prisons. So there's a difference between the camps that are more open and the prisons where the males are just packed in like sardines in a tin in really terrible conditions as well. But that's where the high value Indonesians are detained. And there are probably about a dozen of those. Now, the number of Malaysians is much lower. The total number, the last I heard, was 53 total. And the, the Malaysian government had been in touch with most of the families and they promised, the government promised to help arrange the return, but they promised a lot and there wasn't very much result. So the 53 have been 53 for the last year and a half, basically, and there isn't much. That's a very low number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Malaysia is a small country. I mean, uh, I think that's also important to understand. Philippines never had more than a handful that anybody knew about. There were a couple of people identified by name. And when a BBC team went into the camps to interview Southeast Asians, they were taken around by a little Filipino kid who knew where all the Indonesian tents were in these big refugee camps. But uh, nobody has a figure on whether the number of Filipinos is more than five or six or whether it gets into the double digits. We just don't know. Also one or two Thais, but not very many. Uh, probably one or two Cambodians because there were Cambodians from the Cham minority in Afghanistan as well. And maybe a few other minorities, but it's Indonesians that constitute the vast majority of the Southeast Asians in the camps. Yeah. And uh, the Indonesian returnees, uh, what, how, to what degree are they uh, a source of concern, you think? Okay, so the, the returnees, uh, as opposed to deportees, people who actually went to Syria and then came back, fall into a couple of different categories. The people who went in 2013 or 2014 have basically come back and they haven't been a problem. The Indonesians did arrest about five or six of them. They've served their terms, they've been released, and they're not a problem, and they won't be a problem. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, the people who went in 2015-2016 for the pro-ISIS groups are mostly not a problem because a lot of them came back disillusioned. But we don't know whether the government has a handle on everybody who came back. If they came back and got caught coming in through immigration, then the Indonesian government, of course, knows who they are. But if they got to Turkey, paid their own way uh, on, a, on a legitimate commercial flight, Indonesia may not know if they've come back or not. Then we have the 50 JI members who joined either Al-Qaeda groups or something called the Atara Sham militia. It's an it was a rebel militia, but not linked to either Al Qaeda or ISIS. And those people were given training in military close combat uh, so that they've got real combat skills. But for the moment, JI is still saying that violence in Indonesia is counterproductive. The question is, Will those militants with their new skills stay quiet or will they form 
a splinter group that is frustrated with the inaction of the JI leadership. And that's what we have to be concerned about. One such group has already emerged. They were fortunately caught before they could do anything, but they were planning an attack on police. Uh, Sydney, in, in the new landscape of terrorism in, in Southeast Asia, uh, how is the recruitment process now different than, than before? Can you, can you walk yes, us through that? I think two factors have affected recruitment. One is the increased legal tools available to the police to crack down. So there have been many more arrests and also COVID, which have made the kind of mass rallies, which used to be the first step in recruiting, uh, no longer possible. So it used to be that 95% of the recruitment in Indonesia, for example, took place in Pangajian, in in religious study sessions, usually at mosques or at schools. And there would be a, a kiai or a scholar of some kind who would see a promising student asking questions or a promising individual asking questions. And afterwards, that person might be invited to join a smaller circle. That can't take place in the way it used to. So we're seeing much more recruitment over Facebook and over social media, even though the cyber patrol of Detachment 88 has gotten really good. So there's a lot more monitoring of extremist communications than there was in the past. But sometimes uh, people manage to escape the net. It's interesting that J.I. was so afraid of being tapped or otherwise detected in social media communications that it required all of its members not to use smartphones, but to use old use Nokias uh, and wherever possible to do communication by courier rather than by hape, mm. by handphone. Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh let me move to, uh, you know, we're at the end of the interview. Uh, I want to ask about the United States. And uh, recently, the director for Homeland Security, the former director, has said that the main terrorism challenge in the United States is no longer foreign linked terrorists in the United States, but domestic terrorists, uh, especially uh, white, uh, what do you call it, white nationalist terrorists. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, what is your comment on that? And, uh, and would that somehow affect the U.S. engagement on counterterrorism uh, activities in, in Southeast Asia? I think it's way overdue for the United States to be focusing on white power groups. But they, while they were already very numerous and very dangerous before President Trump took office, they grew by leaps and bounds under his de facto sponsorship. So I think that we are in a much worse situation four years after Trump has uh, now left office than we were at the time he came in, even though it was already much, much worse than anybody in the US was willing to admit. And it's partly a result of gun laws. It's a result of the kind of shift of Republic, the Republican Party to the extreme right. It's the use of the internet to promote fake news. That's not just a problem in Southeast Asia, it's a huge problem in the United States. And I think that now it's a problem that's gotten really way out of control. And it has ramifications for other parts of the globe because these people organize online. They have figured out how to use the internet effectively and they're in touch with fellow right-wing people in lots of white parts of the globe. And that means Europe, Australia, and maybe New Zealand, although that's a fringe area, but certainly Australia and, and Europe are really big areas for white power. And one of the interesting things is if you look at comparing 
Islamist violence and white power violence, both of them now use the internet very effectively. Both rely on their own version of the facts uh, in terms of spreading propaganda. But the recruitment for white power generally took place at music concerts. And there was a whole uh, uh, branch of rock music that was associated with white power. And understanding the, that concert phenomenon is something that I think needs more attention in the United States. Although also with COVID restrictions, it's harder to have those concerts, except in places like Idaho and Wyoming and places that are solidly Republican that don't enforce any COVID restrictions. Uh, the other interesting difference is that by and large, lots of the white power people came from broken families or dysfunctional families, whereas most of the people arrested for terrorism in Indonesia came from very, very stable families where there was total support for their activities within the family. So it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm glad also that President Joe Biden has uh, explicitly named white nationalists as, as a, a threat and, you know, something I think President Trump would not have done, right? Right. Yeah. And I do think that the cooperation on global terrorism more generally will continue, even as the United States focuses on domestic terrorism as well. Okay. Now, uh, Sydney, we're both academics, right? Right. Uh, you know, what I find interesting is that uh, me, I just, my level of analysis is governments usually, right? Or, you know, big units and so, but but uh, y your level of analysis is much uh, more micro. You know, you know the name of individuals, which cell phones uh, they use, uh, which uh, groups, uh, the uh, pengajian uh, groups, and and you know, very very micro level. Uh, and it's just fascinating to hear your uh, analysis uh, on, on on things. I, I'm just wor wondering, what is your methodology to get all this treasure of, of facts and, and data on, on terrorism? I think one thing to uh, remember is that I've been working on this stuff for a really long time now. So I've got the historical connections and that really helps. I can make linkages in my head from, uh, even back to Dar al Islam in the 1950s, because I was working on that when I was w with the Ford Foundation a long time ago in the 1970s. So uh, I've been following this stuff in one way or another for a very long time. And I've got a lot of the early documents. So second thing is that you learn to understand what documents are really useful. And so for me, following terrorism, it's court documents, which are just invaluable. And finally, you can get them online. Uh, everybody who's brought to trial on terrorism charges now, the, the basic court documents are put on the Makama Agung website. Which and if nobody you, reads. Which, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, other people may watch Netflix or read a novel before going to bed. I read trial documents. That's how I go to sleep at oh, night. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> and they're totally fascinating. They're really, they're really fascinating. But when, when I first started working on this after I came back in 2002, after the Bali bombs, actually it started even before the Bali bombs, we were interested in getting one set of trial documents from a guy who was arrested in the 1980s. Nothing was online. And we knew the guy had been tried in the court in Malang. We sent somebody to the court to see if there was a, a file from cases back to the 1980s. And this very nice man pointed to a gudang in the back of the court and said, you can have access, but nothing is filed. It's just piled in there. If you can find it, you're welcome to it. So we hired like six kids from the local village 
to go into the Gudang and see if they could find this one document of Muhammad Akbar. And we found it. We found it by some miracle. So I don't think we've ever used that particular document in a report, but um, it was uh, an important link, we thought, at that stage between the uh, some of the stuff that was happening in 2007 and 8 and uh, an earlier history. But so we rely on those documents. We interview former prisoners. Uh, we've, uh, we don't go into prisons for the most part. I think we've done that once to interview women prisoners, but with the cooperation of the prison authorities, we don't try to sneak in uh, and interview people. Um, and then increasingly over the last three or four years, we've developed very good relations with some officials in the trilateral countries in Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So we now have access to officials and we can ask them directly for information. We don't get documents from them, but they're frequently willing to help out and answer questions. So uh, after the young 17 year old was arrested in, uh, in Holo, in the Southern Philippines, I contacted one of the officials I know who works on Holo and asked him whether uh, the Indonesians had been able to have access to her yet, uh, just in terms of consular services. And he said no, because of COVID restrictions. And till this day, the Indonesian embassy still hasn't had contact with her. And, that's, and she was arrested in October. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, with your ability to connect dots, you you would make a great police detective. You know that? <laughs> Did you ever think about that? No, but I love to read murder mysteries. Ah, okay. <laughs> what, what's the one you would recommend? <laughs> uh, what's the, the the best book you've read uh, recently? Or you, you don't read books anymore? I do read books. Uh, I do read books in addition to the trial documents. Uh, what's the best thriller I've read? I used to love these thrillers from uh, about the World War I period by Alan First. Okay. Thrillers. Okay. And what's the best Netflix uh, film you've uh, watched recently? Uh, I, I don't even get net Netflix on my own television, so I can't even give you an answer to that. You're the only one I know, you know, who don't have Netflix. Everybody <laughs> in COVID, you know, that's what they do. Just yeah. watch Netflix all the time. Well... Well, if I know, did, uh, if I did have Netflix, I would watch The Undoing with Nicole Kidman because I read the book on which it was based and I loved it. Oh, okay. I'm going to watch that tonight then. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Sydney has been fascinating and uh, I want to thank you for really uh, uh, giving us a remarkable tour and, and analysis on terrorism. I don't think, I hope you don't leave the industry because no one can do the this analysis at, at that level that you're doing and with the degree of fairness and uh, independence and objectivity. And I want also want to thank you uh, for staying in Indonesia and for doing a lot of work that really benefits uh, our law enforcement people and you know our, our people uh, in the fight against terrorism. So, so really thank you and it's been a pleasure uh, being uh, your friend for so many years. I think I've known you for about 20, 30 years. Yeah? You were you were doing human rights work and I was in government at the time. You know, yeah. right? I think you gave me a hard time. I Not did. me, <laughs> but the government, right? And you, yeah, were, yeah. you used to be on opposite ends, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, such is the world that now we, we are really good friends. So, so thank you and uh, hope to see you again. And thank you for your good work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.